This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome to the Neurology Podcast. This is Kate Neville from Indiana University. Today I'm talking with Ingo Mellinghoff, Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center on his article, Boracitinib in IDH1 or IDH2 Mutant Low-Grade Gliomas, published in the New England Journal of Medicine last month. Ingo, thank you so much for talking with me today about these exciting results from your study. Thank you for having me. Before we discuss more of the details of the study, can you share with the listeners some of the background and motivation behind the study? So in other words, why was this study done and why is it important? This study is about a drug called voracidinib, and it is the first targeted agent to improve patient outcomes in low-grade glioma. And that really is a bit of a new landmark here, and and that's why it's worth really uh, getting into the weeds about it. And the potential approval of this drug could delay the need for more aggressive therapy in this disease, low-grade glioma, and we are very excited about the results and, and what they mean. And the reason why this study was done, it is about grade 2 glioma in adults. And grade 2 gliomas are a slowly progressive malignant brain tumors with a poor long-term prognosis. Even though grade 2 gliomas are often referred to as low-grade diffuse gliomas due to their slower progression compared to the better-known glioblastomas, they cannot be cured and they cause significant disability. As you know, mortality, premature mortality for patients who have this disease. And the patients who have this disease, they're typically young, about 40 on average. And of course, a very active period in their lives. They're striving to balance a a family life, a professional life, raise children. And and these patients really are in, in great need for a therapy that potentially is less toxic than what is currently offered. And the standard of care for these patients as of today is starting with surgery, maximal safe resection of the tumor. And then after the surgery, um, there is a choice that has to be made whether there should be immediate follow-up treatment with radiation and chemotherapy or a watch and wait period when these patients get their regular MRI scans and neuro exams, but no additional therapy. And that, of course, is a very difficult decision to make every single time. And many patients, when possible, choose this watch and wait period. And there are a number of criteria, as you know, that we apply to make that decision. And what's really exciting that these tumors were found in 2008 to very frequently have a mutation in this metabolic gene called isocitrate dehydrogenase, or IDH. And there's actually two genes, IDH1 and IDH2. And the great majority of the grade 2 gliomas do have a hotspot mutation in either IDH1 or IDH2. And we now know what these mutations do. They disrupt the metabolism of these tumors, and they have a very distinctive set of molecular alterations. And this drug that we're talking about today Voracidinib is an oral inhibitor that targets mutant forms of IDH1 and IDH2. So it's a dual inhibitor that was specifically designed to be brain penetrant. And that, you know, Kate, as you know, is of course unusual that we develop or companies develop a compound specifically for brain tumors. So that was already a first important step with voracidinib. So that is why the study was done. You know, there's a, a target there is an opportunity to shut down the function of the mutant enzyme. And there is a patient population that would really benefit from a therapy that is less toxic and could be introduced early in the disease course. And the IDH mutations, just to finish that thought, they are disease defining in this uh, low-grade glioma group. They're part of the WHO classification of this disease. And they these mutations really are considered to be drivers and they remain detectable throughout the disease course, even as these tumors progress. So the mutations do have a lot of the hallmarks of what we would traditionally consider a driver in cancer. 
Thanks so much for going over that. That was great. And, you know, this is such a nice study. You have your target. You have a drug that was developed specifically for brain tumors. And you have your patients who are in this time frame of this watch and wait period, which is really what you're targeting here after surgery, but before any other treatment. So with that, what are some of the highlights of the study design and characteristics of the patients included in this study? The Indigo study was a global phase three study. It's double blind, placebo controlled, randomized that enrolled patients across 10 countries. So it was a a substantial effort, (laughs) 77 centers. And the goal was to assess the efficacy and safety of daily voracidinib in patients who had residual or recurrent grade 2 IDH1 or IDH2 mutated oligodendroglioma or astrocytoma. So grade 2 is important here. And um, residual, we actually did require the presence of measurable disease at enrollment. And the patients um, were patients who had only received surgery as their only prior treatment. That's important as well. And they were not in need of immediate chemotherapy or radiation, according to their treating physician. The primary endpoint of this study was progression-free survival based on a blinded independent imaging review. So that is very important. So it's imaging-based progression-free survival and an independent review committee uh, made the decision when progression occurred. And and that committee was not aware of the assignment to which treatment group each patient was in. Time to next intervention was an important key secondary endpoint. Patients were stratified by 1P90Q status. That is a molecular alteration that distinguishes what we call oligodendrogliomas from the astrocytomas. And another stratification factor was tumor size. And then what is also important, patients um, were randomly assigned to either placebo or study drug, but at the time of imaging-based tumor progression, they were offered the option to cross over. That was an important feature of the design, cross over to the varsitinib arm. Otherwise, uh, patients had to be uh, 12 years or older and with a KPS of at least 80 and the other eligibility criteria, I think we went over. Again, in summary, as a sort of takeaway, these were patients who were in that watch and wait period that we discussed a little bit earlier, where they had the surgery, they did not yet have radiation or chemotherapy, and they were in that period of time when we watched them very closely with regular MRI scans. And in that setting, they got either the study drug or placebo. So that is a setting where I think maybe the only setting where you can really very cleanly isolate the activity of investigative novel agent in a placebo design. That's great. And can you explain just a little bit what you mean by the, where you can cleanly evaluate just with the prior radiation exposure versus not piece? I would say there are two parts to this answer. The first one is the placebo versus active drug. That, of course, is a design that we rarely use for the evaluation of agents for brain tumor patients. And that you can really do in a setting, in a disease setting, where watch and wait is a widely accepted standard. So, and and that is different from what we often do for the evaluation of brain tumor drugs, which is evaluate them in the recurrent setting, where that would not be an easy or even possible thing to do. So that's um, as it relates to the placebo part of the design. The other aspect I think that you were alluding to is that once patients receive radiation for their brain tumor, there are a number of radiographic changes on the MRI scan, gliosis or scarring we sometimes refer to, that make it sometimes very difficult to distinguish a non-enhancing tumor growth from radiation-related sort of secondary treatment-related changes. And that is making it very difficult to evaluate molecularly targeted agents um, in that setting after radiation. And as you know, we struggled with the response assessment in neuro-oncology for quite a while because of the limitations in the imaging. And again, that was the advantage of this current study that we none of the patients had radiation prior to going on study so that we could take that off the table altogether as a confounding variable. What are the most important results of the study? 
the most important result is that at a pre-planned interim analysis, voracidinib demonstrated a very clear and significant improvement in progression-free survival per blinded independent imaging review compared with the placebo group with a reduction in risk of disease progression or death by 61%. So that is a pretty hefty, strong result. And that is what led the Independent Data Monitoring Committee to recommend unblinding of the study in March of 2023, which we, of course, did immediately. And the median progression-free survival in the study strongly favored the voracidinib arm with a median of 27.7 months versus 11.1 months for the placebo arm. And this benefit in progression-free survival really was consistent across all of the patient subgroups, regardless of the time since surgery, number of prior surgery, presence or absence of 1P19Q. And the key secondary endpoint, which was time to next intervention, was also um, significantly delayed by 74%. So altogether, that's a very strong result, I think a clinically meaningful result. And importantly, the study drug was overall tolerated very well. Adverse events that occurred more frequently with voracidinib than placebo did include increases in LFTs, transaminases, but the uh, liver function abnormalities were reversible and they did not lead to any significant problems. So we were really very excited how well this treatment was tolerated. So it's both the great tolerability as well as the strong results. I think that makes us excited about this study. Yeah, absolutely. Because so many things that we give to patients in neuro-oncology can make people feel poorly or they have fatigue or other side effects. And this is something that really seems like that wasn't the case. So that's really exciting too, in addition to it being effective or showing, you know, efficacy. And one thing that you mentioned earlier about the study design and the ability to cross over that was really so wonderful that when you unblinded everybody based on the interim analysis that all the patients had the opportunity who are on placebo to then go on to study drug if they chose to, which was great too. And most patients took us up on that opportunity. (laughs) So. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you see these results changing the way that we treat patients with IDH mutant low-grade gliomas? For me, there are two or three key findings. One is it is an important first step toward less toxic and more precise cancer therapy for these young patients. It is clear, you know, the study, like any other study, had specific eligibility criteria And every time you have a patient in front of you, you'll see if if your patient fits these criteria. And it is clear that we're just opening the door to progress in this disease. There is a target that is very important. And we actually didn't really know this before the study. Um, There was some discussion to what extent the mutant IDH enzyme indeed contributes to the growth of these tumors once they have developed right? It's something we've been talking about on the scientific side. And it is very clear based on the Indigo study that the mutant enzyme is a drug target in this disease. So I think that's opening the door to combination therapies in various settings, you know, exploration of targeting the mutant enzyme in different settings, as monotherapy as well. And it is really about opening an entire line of investigation, I think, besides the obvious most immediate impact of having a new tool in the armamentarium of the neuro-oncologist, hopefully in the future. And then I think the other, to me, exciting part is that, you know, we really haven't, as you know, okay, very well, we really haven't made a whole lot of progress with developing new therapies for primary brain tumors, and in particular glioma. So I think our field has suffered quite a few setbacks. And what the Indigo study really represents is the culmination of a series of investigations that were really methodical and highly collaborative that led to a positive phase three finding. And for example, after the phase one study that just established safety, we actually conducted a a window of opportunity study just to be 100% sure that the drug does get into the tumor, does turn off the mutant enzyme, 
does change the expression of the genes that we think are important, does result in lower tumor cell proliferation. So that was an additional step that we took prior to picking the agent and the dose for indigo. And I think investing into this additional step, which requires resources, commitment, expertise, essays, and all of that. But I think that was really a key step. And I'm hoping that we can learn from this as a broader lesson for our field, that this is how we want to go ahead and develop new agents for primary brain tumors. You know, start with a compelling compound that perhaps was designed specifically for brain tumors based on the genotype or the blood-brain barrier penetration or both, but then also commit to these sort of window of opportunity studies to be 100% sure that the drug actually goes in. Because we, Kate, you and I have looked at all these single arm studies that give perhaps a promising signal, but then fail in phase three. So we're hoping that maybe this could be a path forward for drug development. And I think that would be a larger conclusion perhaps from Indigo, hopefully. This happened during the COVID pandemic. You know, we enrolled 331 patients during the COVID pandemic in all these different countries. And it speaks to the need for our patients to come and participate in a clinical trial during this, but also the commitment of, you know, the company and the investigators, the study teams and all of that to see it through. And and it it was concluded in a relatively short period of time. So these are all things that I'm excited about. (laughs) Absolutely. What long-term follow-up? is planned and what else do you think will come out from this study a group of patients we're continuing to collect follow-up data as part of this study protocol and we will be presenting new data you know from this study as it becomes available for example as it relates to volumetric studies that we've done to assess tumor growth rates it is key to remember that this is the final result. You know, this was a pre-planned second interim analysis. Everyone is unblinded. And so this, to some extent, this has to be viewed as a final result, but we will definitely be very curious to find out, you know, in the next five to 10 years, exactly what happens to these patients over time. I think as as a field, you know, these are the questions I think that, that we're asking ourselves. What are the potential mechanisms of resistance? What is the role of combination therapy? This is, I think, the the beginning of an exciting new series of trials and investigations. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Ingo. It's my pleasure, Kate. Thank you for having me. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes. Or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.